one. Great. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm uh, I'm Dr. Rory Cooper, and I'm uh, chairing this uh, this committee and helping to lead this wonderful group on the conversation series about accessibility and inclusion in STEM. Uh, we have a wonderful panel and a team from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine working with us. Um, I'm uh, wearing a blue sweater, and a I'm a white male um, in my early 60s, and I uh, use a wheelchair uh, as a means of mobility due to a spinal cord injury. And in the background, you can see a, uh, a bookshelf and some uh, plaques on the wall. I am sitting in my office uh, today. So, um, and I use the pronouns uh, he or him or his. So, um, the uh, this is a conversation series that will take place in five parts. Uh, we have pre-recorded keynote sessions. I hope that you took the opportunity to listen to uh, for now, Dr. Um, Okalami's wonderful keynote session. I enjoyed it myself. I had the privilege of meeting uh, having meeting him at the University of Pittsburgh a few years ago, and actually um, giving him a tour of some of our resources. Um, so uh, I would like to next introduce uh, allow our committee members to briefly introduce themselves. Maybe we can start with uh, with Cheryl. Oh. I'm Cheryl Bergstaller from the University of Washington in Seattle, and there I direct Accessible Technology Services, which includes the DO-IT Center, and DO-IT stands for Disabilities, Opportunities, Internetworking, and Technology, and the IT Accessibility Team for our campus. I'm also an affiliate professor in the College of Education. Great, thank you. Um, Carolyn, how would you like to introduce yourself? Up, oh, you're on mute. Oh, there. Hi, my name is Carolyn. I am the uh, tech professor for technology and, and science as well. I'm also uh, to classes at, uh, for University of Gallaudet. My background is a white wall with shelves. I have a globe on one of the shelves. It is nice to see you all here today, and I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, Christopher? Good afternoon, folks. Uh, Chris Atchison, faculty or uh, professor of geoscience education at the University of Cincinnati. I am also the founder of the International Association for Geoscience Diversity. Um, and I am a white male with a uh, graying beard and a green jacket. Good to see you all. Uh, Julian, would you like to go next? Uh, yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Julian Brinkley. I'm an assistant professor of human centered computing uh, here at uh, Clemson University. Um, I lead the design and research of in-vehicle experiences lab where we uh, explore issues of accessibility uh, and how to design and prototype technologies uh, for personal mobility. Uh, I am in early 40s, uh, black male with a blue shirt. Thank you. Um, great. Then let's see. I don't. Well, I don't see any of the committee members. Alexis, are you? You're no. I think that's it, right? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's not. I. Uh, So I forgot Emily. There you go, Emily. Would you please introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Emily Ackerman. I'm a postdoc at the Systems Biology Department at Harvard Medical School. Um, I am a 
white woman with long brown hair and glasses, and I am a wheelchair user as well. Wonderful. Um, just a few logistics items. Uh, please uh, use the um, reactions bar at the bottom of the Zoom. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Zoom nowadays to, um, to raise your hand. And um, you can also post things in the chat. And, and Kate and I will try to, uh, to use those uh, to help facilitate the conversation today. And um, I would now, uh, you've met Emily and Cheryl Bergstaller. They have agreed to be the host for today's session and moderate the conversation. Um, Emily is a chemical engineer um, who is currently working as a postdoc in the Lahab lab at, at Harvard Systems Biology Department. And Cheryl is the Director of Accessibility Technology Services and Affiliate Professor at the University of Washington. They are both planning committee members and I would now welcome them to moderate this session. So thank you all for participating. And I'd like to thank our panel members in advance. I'm, I'm sure that Emily and Cheryl will introduce them. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you so much everybody for attending. Um, before we dive in uh, with our panelists, I wanna provide an opportunity for our speaker to provide sort of an overview of the highlights of the pre-recorded keynote talk. Um, we hope that you were able to see it before uh, today's event, but if you haven't, that's okay. Uh, it's still on the website um, and will be available along with this recording. Um, so our keynote speaker uh, for this first conversation is Dr. Farami Ogunlami, uh, who is an assistant professor of family medicine, physical medicine, and rehabilitation, as well as urology at Michigan Medicine. He's the director of services for students with disabilities and the director of the adaptive sports and fitness uh, division of student life at the University of Michigan. So Dr. Ogunlami, uh, would you please give us sort of a brief overview of the key points from your talk about intersectionality, um, ableism and racism, and how you think STEM can integrate, uh, you know, these ideas into um, our education and research. Recording in progress. Certainly, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. And thank you to all of you at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. I am Fermi Okunlami. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am a young to middle-aged black man with brown skin. I've got on some clear rimmed glasses. I've got short black hair. I've got on a dark blue blazer with a blue collared shirt and a wooden bow tie. In my background, there are some drawers and an American flag and a plant and a scooter that I think Dr. Cooper could do some pretty cool things to if I let him get his hands on it. Uh, as introduced, I, I run disability services for the University of Michigan, and I'm also a, a clinical faculty in the medical school uh, here at Michigan and also at UCLA. So I tell people often that the sort of the framework for this talk, you said give some highlights. Now, I, I hope that the, the, the points I bring up were considered highlights or not. I, I'm not sure if people enjoyed the talk or not, but I get really excited when we get an opportunity to do this because it was really a chance to have a conversation or start a conversation about things that are very important to me. And, and I say they're important to me because in these conversations, I, I also talk about my own humility and authenticity and vulnerability of a topic that is near and dear to my heart because of my lived experience. But by the end of it, what I was hoping to demonstrate is that one needn't have a particular lived experience to be able to then recognize the importance of equity and inclusion in our society. So I, I talked really about juxtaposing sort of racism and ableism and the fact that we have two systemic structures here that are because our society was not created or built or fashioned with certain people in mind. So not being difficult or jarring or controversial, but we know the history of our country was that certain people that looked like me were allowed to be property, were allowed to be beaten and hanged and sold and used. And I'm talking about people of color. 
But at that same time, individuals with disabilities have not been seen as fully human, just like Black people were not seen as fully human. And so ableism and racism are systemic frameworks and structures that then disadvantage specific populations. And so I was not pointing fingers at individuals and saying, you are racist and you are ableist. But in order for us to then start a conversation about ableism, today in the past sort of year and a half in our country, we have seen racism be sort of front and center in conversations, something that should have happened long ago. And that despite the fact that we allegedly have laws that then make that illegal, we still see the effects of racism today. And so to talk about ableism, something that people have not had the same experience with articulating. People don't recognize how inaccessible our world really is. People don't recognize how they may be unintentionally perpetuating these systemic injustices. I was inviting people in to then see the world from that viewpoint because I said that before I entered this world, as I call it, on the other side of the stethoscope, as an individual with a disability that takes care of people with disabilities myself, I did not fully appreciate how inaccessible our world was and did not appreciate the fact that there are still things in place that limit people's participation. And so then in STEM, we do have an opportunity and I say an obligation to then make the STEM field accessible and inclusive to everyone. And so utilizing disability as a framework to then tie how that then connects with every single community that we're talking about. If we create accessibility for the disabled community, we will then by design be creating accessibility for everyone. If we then support our most marginalized and disadvantaged of individuals, we are going to then be creating access for everyone. I talk about how everyone can use the ramp while not everyone can use the stairs. And so hopefully we will then start in this conversation of trying to then build ramps to then provide access for all people. And that by centering these conversations around the disabled community, we will recognize that a rising tide will raise all boats and we'll get to a day where hopefully we can create a tomorrow that is better than people's yesterday. Because the yesterdays of America did not include people that looked like me, did not include people that looked like Emily, did not include people that looked like Julian. And there are many of us that need to then have that access because having that access is going to then make the work that we all do better. Despite the fact that it's the right thing to do, despite the fact that diversity, equity, and inclusion are things that we should believe in, in the body of work that we're doing, we aren't going to create solutions that are going to then better our world if we don't have people that then are diverse in those conversations, dictating and determining and contributing to all of the amazing advances that we will be able to have in science, technology, engineering, medicine, mathematics. So that is a brief sort of synopsis of what I was hoping to then begin in this conversation. And I look forward to continuing the conversation in this panel today. Thank you so much for that. I, I really enjoyed uh, your talk and I think it's such a, a needed and refreshing perspective that we don't often get um, on these kinds of science talks. So thank you uh, for sharing your story with us. Um, and so I guess we can move to kind of introducing uh, our uh, panelists today who have joined us uh, for a kind of a structured uh, conversation uh, and then as well as some live uh, Q&A. So uh, to do some introductions, we're joined today by Dr. Kate Seelman, who is the Associate Dean and a Professor of Rehabilitation Science and Technology at the School of Health and Rehab Science at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we have Dr. Gabi Serrata Marks, who is a marine geochemist, uh, also a freelance science writer and patient advocate here in Boston with me. Uh, and Alexis Mobley, who is a grad student in neuroimmunology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, in the UT Health Graduate School of Biomedical Science. So welcome, uh, Kate, Alexis, and Gabi. Uh, we're so glad to have your expertise here today. And we're going to start with some questions uh, that we can uh, do some free response with our panelists, as well as planning committee members, if you have 
any thoughts, um, please share. Uh, for those of you that are listening in the webcast, um, if you have questions or thoughts that you'd like to share, um, please put them in the Q&A chat. We're going to be incorporating them as we speak. Um, so any and all thoughts, fire away. Um, so our first question for the group is, uh, what do we think that we can learn from research and practice regarding other marginalized groups that can help us to guide our practices with respect to people with disabilities in our environments? Um, so would anybody like to start? Would you repeat the question? Again, sure. Please? So the question is, what can we learn from research and practice regarding other marginalized groups that can help guide a similar research and practice with respect to disabled people? So what can we learn essentially from work that's been done uh, with other marginalized groups? Gabi, would you like to go first? Yeah, I think the important thing that we can notice for sure is including the members of those groups when we're doing research on that group. I think it really should be with that group as opposed to researching um, like we're an external kind of group. So there are excellent disabled social scientists, um, scientists, many of them are here on this call. Um, so I hope that we can hope, I hope that we can include our expertise, their expertise, um, in studying this group, um, I think that's one of the most important factors. Yeah, that's a great point. I think done nothing about us without us um, kind of slogan applied to the science that we do in our, our actual academic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is Fermi. I'll, I'll jump in there as well. Now, many people that know me know that I, I go straight for the jugular and I, I like having some of these uncomfortable conversations. And so what I'll say is that what we can learn, and this is something I learned from our outgoing chief diversity officer here at the University of Michigan, is that oftentimes people wait for the system to do the right thing. And they ask the system to change. They ask for things that should have been done in the past. And I was one of those people that asked for things to change, thinking that it would happen. And the reason why I said that I go for the jugular and I'm being direct is because it was that chief diversity officer that told me, if you want to see history, if you want to look through history to see how change has occurred, never has the majority group or the group in power gone and said, hmm, you know what, we've been owning these slaves for a while now and we should probably set them free. You know, I, I think that that's probably a good idea. We should give them their free. No. That's not how it happened. What happened is a group of people said, hey, there's this railroad underground that we can then get on and we can get out and then we can fight the system to actually get to where we need to be. So what we can learn is the fact that it's going to take a lot of work to get these systems to change. It's going to take people then speaking up and acknowledging the fact that there is a problem. And so while many of us are unaware of some of the injustices that exist, when we look at these populations that have already been identified as marginalized and disadvantaged, it is a still a struggle to then get equity and inclusion. So what the disability community can look at is say, yes, we're 31 years post ADA now, but we still have a long way to go. And therefore we cannot rest until we then continue to demonstrate the inaccessibility of all these environments that we're in. So this is not inciting you know, violence by any means, but what it is saying is that it's going to take active communication and participation to then move a needle that without this voice, without the voices of individuals with and without disabilities, recognizing this as a problem without leveraging the work of other marginalized groups and what has happened in history before, we are not going to then move far enough into what we need to be in the future. Uh, this is Alexis. Um, I I'm definitely agree with all of that. And I'm, I'm glad you said that because I feel like we keep having discussions, which is always great. Um, you know, if you haven't heard these voices, if you haven't heard stories, maybe you're not aware. Um, maybe you don't fully understand how 
you know, you may take advantage like, okay, I can walk down the sidewalk, but not understand that how, how bad cracks in a sidewalk can be for people that don't walk um, or don't walk well. Um, you know, I used to walk all the time. And now that I have a walker um, to get around, my, a lot of my life has stopped because if you've ever seen a sidewalk in Houston, if you can find them, A, but B, just how poorly maintained they are, um, you you just get to the point where you're like, I, I, I don't want to anymore, you know? And I think that's always something to keep in mind um, when you're in your environment is, you know, I, I've always kind of been the person, the only person in the room. And that's something that I've always kind of had to live with. So if you're not used to being that person, take a moment to say, okay, what would it feel like if I was that only person in the room? What would it feel like trying to navigate these different ways? And there, there's so many stories, there's so many resources. And so you may need to take some time to get into that mindset, but once you're there, action is what's going to be important. And it's not going to be comfortable or easy as we've seen from any other type of of group that has worked towards um, equity and inclusion um, and, and ultimately to justice. It, it hasn't been easy. Um, and it's been really trying to change policies um, and change the power dynamics and power. It, it's kind of like inertia, you know, nothing's gonna move until you put some, some pretty strong force on it. Um, and we're really just trying to build up that momentum so that once we really hit that thing, um, it, it's gonna start I, things are going to move quickly after that point. I think once we finally kind of, again, another science term, but hit that activation energy, um, everything else will will kind of come in place, but we still haven't reached that point yet. And we just need more people to get along, um, especially the people in power to help change those systems um, so that we can overcome and, and do um, amazing things and make, make the world accessible. That's great, yeah. Uh, Kate, would you like to? Come in. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think back at uh, some of the things we did at the University of Pittsburgh uh, that were fun. So I'm going to give you an example once. A black wheelchair hip hop group visited Dr. Cooper in his laboratory, and there was a wonderful interaction between them. Also, that same hip hop group uh, uh, filled a theater in Pittsburgh with one of the most diverse audiences you would ever hope to see in the theater. Another thing that happened at Pitt, uh, which was fun, if difficult, was uh, uh, organizing, uh, and faculty had something to do with this, but the first disability-led student with disability uh, organization at uh, at Pitt and uh, it, it really has worked it worked out pretty well. Those are just two fun things that faculty can be involved with uh, in some way and very clearly that leads that leads you to something like uh, um, you, you get to know these students and these people leads you to disability studies and not only uh, the scientific method, but the, the legitimacy of the narrative of the person's life. The, and one more thing as uh, in our more professional capacities are the models that our disciplines have uh, set down for us, one in medicine and one with all due respect to Dr. Cooper who doesn't represent this model at all and probably the other engineers here, but let's start with the medical model. And, uh, the medical model assumes uh, decision-making in the, in the professional, as you well know, and the knowledge base is very limited to science itself. Uh, the engineering model that I think of, which is a technology development model, uh, didn't include participation. Uh, and we don't have participation in the development of devices and products uh, for people with disabilities. Uh, to be all inclusive, universal design, uh, and no testing, uh, then you have uh, a model that, as you know, is, is just not going to work either. So uh, these two models for careers uh, and, and disciplines that are very close to us here today uh, uh, need to be challenged further. Thank you.
Okay, thank you all for that. Um, we can move on. Cheryl, would you like to do the next question? Sure, I have one comment on the on your question too. Um, and one thing is we're looking at you know future leaders today, but also future leaders. Uh, and one thing I used learned particularly from the women's movement, um, the age where I grew up, um, and um, people that uh, are going to be good leaders often need to be provided with opportunities to be leaders. And we in our Do It Center work a lot with uh, teenagers uh, who have disabilities and they have a lot of ideas, they have a lot of energy, but very often students with disabilities just haven't been uh, given the opportunity to be leaders in their schools and their communities and so forth. They're kind of just expected to be rather passive and they kind of get used to being in that role. So we all need to, to work for helping young people who have disabilities get those leadership opportunities, opportunities to express themselves and so forth. And the other thing to remember that is that uh, any one person represents that one person. And so there's a great diversity within the disability community. So we need to listen to a lot of voices. I hear sometimes that, you know, groups say, well, we have a person with a disability on our group and they're representing all people with disabilities. Well, no, they're not. It was important to have a person with a disability in a group, but we need to hear a lot of different voices and all that we do. Now we're going to segue into something we've been talking about um, as in our leadership team for this project, and that is intersectionality. Uh, and so the question is, in what ways does or should intersectionality issues, I'm talking here about people that have multiple disabilities, like a person who's blind, but also has a learning disability, who has who is on the autism spectrum, but also is, has a mobility impairment, but also between uh, disability um, and other marginalized groups, uh, status such as race or ethnicity, uh, gender, other marginalized group status. Um, so how should this intersectionality inform our research and practice with respect to people with disabilities? So kind of tech in a next step and thinking more about intersectionality as far as practice and as far as research. Uh, just one comment I'll make is in uh, many of our programs that deal with one marginalized groups, let's say uh, our students on campus who are ethnic minorities, uh, are not very welcoming to students with disabilities who might be in that ethnic group that they're serving. So how do, what, what do we need to do here as far as practice and research when we think about intersectionality? So this is, this is Fermi. I'm gonna jump in first and say thank you for the question and provide some additional context for, from my perspective, because I think that often when we talk about intersectionality, what people hear in intersectionality is multiple identity groups. Now, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a, is, a, is a black woman who truly coined the term intersectionality, has said it best, but what intersectionality truly is, it is a framework of oppression, essentially. And is the fact that having multiple marginalized identities is not just an additive impact. So if you have a disability and you're a woman, if you are a person of color and you have any other insert marginalized group here, it's actually an exponential impact on the oppression. So I think that too often when people hear intersectionality, they use it really when they're trying to say diversity, right? They're saying, oh, well, you've got multiple identity groups that you are part of. And so how can we make sure that we are supporting each other with our multiple identities? Now, that's a really good thing. So I want to make sure that we can speak to that during this answer as well, because there are spaces, as Esther brought up, that may not be as welcoming to one facet or subset of that group because you know, the black disabled folks are not being nice to the brown disabled folks. And it's like, wait a minute, how do we address that? But intersectionality as a term is something that the definition is actually lost at times. And it's the fact that we must recognize the additive and exponential impact on having a marginalized identity and how that then makes it such that there are additional barriers that that person experiences as a result of that. And so we need to then address the intersectionality component to say, you know, there's a wonderful image that one of my colleagues, Dr. Valencia Walker used when we gave a talk about this. This image has two people at the starting line of a race, and then there's a finish line in the distance. And one individual is a Caucasian man, and then the other individual is a black woman. And in their lanes, there's nothing in the way between the start and the finish for the Caucasian man. But for the black woman, her legs are already chained down to the ground before she can start. 
There are alligators and crocodiles and hurdles and bombs and all sorts of things on the way to the finish line. And then the caption says, but the distance is the same. So that is what intersectionality then is a, is a part of trying to demonstrate, is not just that we need to be cognizant of the different identity groups that people are part of, but that we also must recognize the impact that has on the reason why their journey is going to be more arduous and more difficult than someone else's. Now, I will say before I pass it on that I am not being critical of that white man. I'm not being critical of majority groups by any means. So it is not my fault that I'm a disabled black man anymore it's, than it's Dr. Cooper's fault that he's a disabled white man, right? But we need to recognize the identities that we are in and how some of those positions put us in positions of privilege and I recognize the privilege that I have at the same time as I can acknowledge the prejudice that I've experienced. So just a little you know, addition to, to throw in there as we consider this. Yeah. Great contribution. Uh, who else would like to comment on this? Uh, so I would definitely love to jump in on that as well, um, because I think something that I've noticed, especially when it comes to anti-racism work, you know, people tend to shy away from oh, well, I got called a racist, something I did was racist or something I did was ableist. Um, and then they, you know, they want to make you feel bad for their mistakes. And I think it's important to remember that not only do you have to be culturally competent of whatever that intersection is going to be, but you also have to realize that it takes work and anything that you have to work with, you're going to make mistakes. Um, anything you're going to do is going to be messed up. I mean, even me now being more physically disabled um, and, and more apparently disabled, you know, I had to still work against my own internal ableism and, and deconstruct that within myself. And so even though I may not have been outwardly like, oh, no, I'm ableist and I've done this and I've done that and, and tried to put, put the pressure and the blame on other people for calling out my faults, um, I just realized, oh, that's a boundary. You know, I won't do it again. I, I work to do better. And so I think it's also being cognizant that it's not necessarily easy work. Um, and you're going to have to to do some of it yourself. But if you mess up, you know, okay, I learned something new today. Um, and we move on and, and we make the world a better place. And, and we, we work together um, in these types of ideas. And again, just being cognizant of that that balance between you know where's my privilege and and where are my disadvantages and, and where am i where am i being cut off at the same time um and i know with the black and x um event our our motto is lift as you climb you know um there's going to be people that are above you in different ways there's going to be people that are going to be below you in different ways um but that doesn't mean that you don't lean on other supports and you don't bring other people up with you because yeah okay i'm a grad student i'm a black i'm a black woman but i can talk to junior high and high school students you know there are people that aren't where i am and so i can bring them up as same as i would lead on or lean on uh, senior faculty and so it's it's not only being culturally aware but also figuring out how you can um, spread these dynamics and and notice what's going on in the room and what's going on in the environment. And like I said, I know it sounds exhausting, but at the same time, there's people like me that have to deal with it every day, you know, <laughs> that goes into a room and I'm like, well, dang, I'm real uncomfortable, <laughs> but I'm going to try my best and, and I'm going to speak my truth and I'm going to be authentically me um, and whatever other things that people feel, you know, that's on them. That's for them to work through. That's not my responsibility. Um, but it's still my responsibility to notice, okay, well, there's only me in this room. So who am I going to sponsor today? Like whose name am I going to bring in? Whose discussion am I going to bring? And I think that's always important as well when you go to intersections, again, not just, okay, what are all these other identities, but how, again, the, the power balance and what can you do again to shake up that system? Nicely said. Thanks for sharing. Gabby, do you have something to say on this topic? You look like you do. I have lots, but Kate's raising her hand. So if she wants to go first, she oh, can go ahead. Okay, we can go Kate next. I can keep seconds. I'm okay. <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that uh, is uh, missing 
people with disabilities, Gadawas, are poor. I remember I was talking to a professor, a friend of mine, who was teaching at a very distinguished women's college, and they were actively rec recruiting uh, from quote unquote minority population. And they had more trouble integrating lower class people, however you want to, uh, than, uh, you know, didn't know which fork to use, uh, uh, than they had otherwise. Now, if you have uh, three or four identities like this, uh, of course, you're in even more trouble. I was looking at the number of, at one point, uh, the number of uh, students on SSI and SSDI uh, who are disabled. And I think it would be very important to continue to collect data of this kind so we know what their situation is. Not, not just, and, and I'm really, I'm so happy that NSF and so on are continuing to collect data on number of uh, people with disabilities in STEM but let's know a little bit more about them. And uh, so I think class is a big issue here and it's uh, not one that we as in our country in the United States uh, recognize very much. Thank you. Yeah. Navi, do you wanna yeah. add to that? So many things I wanna talk about yeah. on this. Clearly I'm like, um, I think about this a lot in terms of academic hierarchy and STEM hierarchy, because I think it's a sort of a unique experience um, in that I noticed that as a grad student at MIT, I actually had more privilege than full-time staff members, not faculty, but staff, because it's much harder to get rid of a grad student than it is to get rid of a staff member, for example. And so having conversations like that, where I was like, but I'm like, 23 and I am I have no idea what I'm doing with my life or I have these other aspects of my identity where I feel like I don't have that privilege but understanding for myself like now that I I do have a PhD that gives me more privilege than people who don't um, walking around with my institutional badge when I'm at a doctor's visit I get treated differently and so I'm trying to recognize as I move through the world as like an early career disabled woman uh, I'm Mexican American. I'm part of the LGBTQ community. All of these identities that are so important to me that I'm like, this is this can be really hard as a scientist to be trying to push through with these aspects of my identity, and also remembering that I have to hold on to those privileges that I do have, and just like Alexis was saying, bring people around me to make sure that I'm not the only one, because um, I know that I am only able to, I was only able to get a PhD because of disabled advocates who came before me. Um, and so I'm trying to like hold all of that at once. And that's why I think this is a really interesting conversation to have. Yeah. Any additional comments on this, uh, this conversation about intersectionality? Okay, Emily, let's go on to the next question. Great. Yeah. So uh, the next uh, the final three questions have more to do about uh, what we can do, like actions we can take. Um, so the first is, how uh, can we move from diversity, you know, that kind of on paper um, check mark for who we have, towards true equity in our educational and research environments? So what changes or things would you like to see happen? Um, I'll, I'll hop in first. I'll try to keep it on the disability side more than some, some of the other ones. But um, I think one of the biggest things I would love to see is honestly just accessibility, like in the lab. Um, a lot of people and, and breaking down preconceived notions of what a scientist should be or, or look like or act. Um, one of my accommodations for my graduate school is that I actually have a research assistant that does the physical side of my research um, because I, I just can't um, from day to day. I don't know how my body is going to be. Um, I, I don't know if my hands are going to cooperate. Um, and so my, my home has become my office. You know, I work exclusively from home um, and I have a bunch of um, accessibility aids at home to make my work easier. 
but I got a lot of resistance from other people trying to tell me, well, you're not a real scientist because you're not in the lab doing the techniques. Um, and to that, <laughs> um, one of them was, I'm sorry, but um, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry because I have over a decade worth of actual laboratory technique experience. So I don't need any more, A. Um, but B, what are you calling your PIs? You know, when was the last time your PI was actually in the lab physically doing the work with you, um, sitting beside you? Um, are they not scientists, the people that you're answer to? And if not, then why are you training under them? That just doesn't make sense. Um, and so the fact that I, I tried to do certain things within my lab to make things easier, um, having things like electronic pipettes, um, trying to make sure that, you know, benches were the, were the right, right way. And I, I think... Um, as I've told people, funding is, is going to be really important in all of this. And people want to say, ah, well, it's a waste of money. It's not. It's an investment. Um, being able to have labs that are accessible and spaces that are accessible makes everybody else's life easier. Um, and even though I have a, an end of one experience, but my, my daughter loves all of my accessibility aids because it makes her life easier, um, even though she isn't disabled. Um, and half the time I'm telling her to give me my stuff back. Um, but that's, it's, it's still that she's able to notice that, hey, since mom has XYZ and, and this has been easier for her, this, this makes my life a little bit easier. I don't have to use as much energy to, to go around and do these things. And I think as, as people start to realize and notice those, like, yeah, there's certain things that may be hard. Like I hate why doctor's office has extremely heavy doors <laughs> and they're not usually electronic and it doesn't make any sense. But you see more people going through electronic doors than physically opening them themselves. Um, and that's an accessibility aid. You know, you see people preferring sometimes ramps over the steps. That's an accessibility aid. And so you don't realize how much better your life can actually be once it's accessible to everybody um, and it makes it easier that way. So. I would just say work towards accessibility, do that, those investments, plan for more money because you're just going to make it better. I mean, even down to captioning, I've had issues where people are like, ah, I hate captions, they're annoying. And I'm like, science is an international sport um, and I can't understand everybody's um, accents and the way that they may say things or, or denote things. And now I have the captions and I can say, ah, Okay, now I know what you're talking about. And the whole time I'm not like, what is this word? What are they trying to say? And then I miss the entire presentation. Um, and so there's just things like that that you may not ever know that is gonna be great, but I'm gonna say in a way, take the risk um, and believe that accessibility is also gonna make your life easier too. Um, you know, listen to disabled people. We tend to quote unquote predict things before they happen. Um, so if you really wanna know what's going on, get on disability Twitter and, and hear what we have to say, because we'll be able to tell you almost down to the T um, how things are gonna unfold and, and the way they're gonna go. Um, so yeah, invest, use your money um, towards, towards those things. Yeah, thank you so much. Any other thoughts on what you would like to see change? Yeah, Kate. Yeah. Uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's a good idea to have somebody who is uh, an advocate for people with disabilities within the sciences in the university situation, a vice president, for example. Having banged my head and whatever else against other doors within universities, uh, for example, the employment office, which surely has to change if we're going to get people out into the employment. You know. uh, and there are many, uh, and uh, as our guest speaker mentioned, uh, there's a diversity uh, office. Sometimes it's at the uh, vice president's level, sometimes it's not. And even if it is, uh, it would depend on, quite frankly, budgets, uh, which is a word that should be brought up here. Uh, you know, uh, in any situation, uh, or at least for the most part, it will cost money to be make something accessible. When I was at in rehab science at, uh, at Pitt, my dean actually tried to make the classroom accessible for those uh, with very little hearing, which include me. 
uh, it was very difficult to do that. It's not the same kind of, of ramp that we can build for, uh, but he tried and, uh, and we had, we engaged the audiology uh, department. So uh, I would say infrastructure is very, very important and budget is very, very important uh, if you want to have power uh, in the, well, any environment, but we're talking about the university. Yeah, absolutely. I think that just as a kind of to add to that, I think it's important to acknowledge that universities and, and companies are built in, you know, able body mode, they're built um, without thinking with forethought. And so any engagement in, in change is, is difficult. It's, it's an effort that has to be um, purposeful, I think. And so, yeah, you run into like the budget, the, the people that are willing to do it. Um, so yeah, there's, it, it's going to take institutional change on quite a large scale for most of the, the changes that we'll probably bring up, right? Uh, Dr. O? I'll let Gabby go. I saw her hand go up at the same time. Mine's quick, which is don't use your students as your broader impacts criteria unless you are providing them with benefits including funding, including whatever supports they might need for all of those identities. Um, if you are saying that you have a disabled lab member and like, oh my gosh, I'm supporting this Latina disabled lab member, like you better have a research assistant like Alexis has, like you better have whatever they need. You can write it in your grant, that's fine, but you better have whatever they need to succeed if you're going to include us as the impact that you are making on science. It's my hot take. That that's actually a perfect sort of segue into I was going to make two brief points because keeping in line with what I say in terms of being a straight shooter go for the jugular. We all talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion now. Everyone's having keynotes and webinars and sessions on it. Everybody recognizes that if they don't seem like they care about diversity, someone's gonna come and say that they're a problem. But the problem that now exists is, while everyone is now willing to then create diversity, meaning variety, difference, people with different backgrounds, people are not actually prepared to be inclusive. They're not actually to then make ready to make things accessible, as Alexis said. And so as you were just saying, Gabi, is that you need to actually be prepared to provide the things that individuals need if they're coming. And so, you know, I was going to tell a really brief story that I'll, I'll tell the abridged version, but I was at an institution that's actually a health sciences institution, and they were talking about how their students that were requesting accommodations for high stakes exams and that they're saying, you know, we're doing these students a disservice because they're not going to get accommodations in the real world. And so we're setting them up for failure by accommodating them now, right? And the institution, you know, I was having dinner with the, the leadership before I gave my keynote and they asked me, so, you know, what do you suggest that we do when these students, you know, are asking for their accommodations? You know, we really want to provide them, but don't you think that it would just be better for us to, to make them, you know, do what they're going to be expected to do in the real world? And I paused and I said, no, I, I think you should give them their accommodations. And they said, well, and I know, you know we really want to, but it, it, we're really, we're setting them up for failure. And, you know, I, 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 we want to do the right thing. So, you know, how do you think we address this? And I paused again and I said, hmm, that's a good question. You should give them their accommodations. And then one more time they said, no, but really, I get, you know, we, we, we've been giving them accommodations. We get what you're saying. And I was like, ah, you know what? I've got the answer. I figured this out. You're right. I haven't been hearing you clearly. What you should do is not admit students with disabilities since you're not prepared to take care of them. And then there was silence. Because this isn't just some sort of joke. This isn't some sort of feel good thing. This is actually about human rights. And so if you're not prepared to provide people with what they need, do me a favor and don't even include me in your presentation, in your population. I would much rather be at a place that acknowledges the fact that they still have room to improve and that they're going to work with me 
to then figure out what accessibility needs I have. And like Alexis said, that more people are going to benefit from you getting your institution to an accessible and inclusive institution. It's not just going to be the individuals with disabilities. And the part that I need to highlight that we haven't spoken publicly about in this session, but we've talked a lot about things that you can see. Not all disabilities are visible. And so the more you then go towards creating accessibility and inclusion, individuals with and without disabilities will then recognize that this is an institution that cares and we can make sure that the environment is inclusive of all people with and without visible and invisible disabilities. And so that's why don't you know, miss me with your DEI initiatives that are just meant to check boxes if you're not actually going to then implement the resources, the change that's needed. And the last part of it is this is truly about changing stigma because people think that they're lowering the bar for people with disabilities when they do these things. They think that you're not going to get the same academic rigor. They think that if you're not the one pipetting that you're not gonna be a good scientist. If you're not the one doing insert whatever tactic here, that later on in life, you're not gonna contribute. And as Alexis said, look at the PIs, look at the senior faculty, they're not still doing all of those things. So why do we need people to be pluripotent stem cells that can do everything when they're going to then differentiate into whatever specific thing they want to work on and we can then give them the tools to be that. We are not then allowing these amazing people with potential to add to the body of work of what we do when we are merely failing to provide accessibility. And I think I said this in the keynote, but accessibility provides access. It does not guarantee success. We still have to work hard to be successful. And you providing an accommodation is not then giving me a leg up to be successful. It's merely providing the appropriate and reasonable and necessary access for me to then demonstrate that I can be successful. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and we have two uh, questions left. Cheryl? I think Kat had a comment. Kat, do you have a comment on that one? Yeah. Uh, Kate? <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a comment. When I was director of NIDR, uh, we put accessibility on as a budget line uh, on uh, grants that were to be competed. And uh, NSF could do, maybe it does, uh, that it would help from the end that Gabby's talking about when you have the student right there and you see all the possibilities of this young person. Uh, so, and we are all in professional organizations. Uh, we can find out whether NSF, NIH, and its various institutes have that budget line under certain grant situations. To briefly answer that, I know the NIH does. Um, if you end up having a, I know for sure an F grant, you can get a disability supplement. Um, but just because you have that mechanism doesn't mean that your institution or your grants offices know how to leverage those mechanisms either. Um, because I have been waiting over a year <laughs> to, um, even though the paperwork is done, it has not been submitted because our, our special projects office just doesn't understand um, how that works. Um, and so th they may be there, but <laughs> I think that's also part of the accessibility is, is training people to understand how to leverage those mechanisms and, and work through them so that you can do that. Yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. Yeah, I'd like to say sometimes uh, grant people have written grants and they don't include that accessibility in their grant money to say, well, what can I do? I, you find the money somewhere else in your grant. It, it's like we get a pile of money. I get a lot of grants. So there's a pile of money there. And I always include accessibility issues in what we're doing. But even if I didn't, if I have some of these accommodation, you just cut back somewhere else. We do it every day in our grants. We rebudget and just make that case. You can't decide that after that. Well, we didn't budget for accessibility. And so we, we don't need to provide it. Uh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> So I think we're, should we move on to the next question? Yeah. Um, I was thinking yeah. we could combine them, maybe. What? If you want to combine them, they're kind of related to part question. 
Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. How can we support those with a, a combination of marginalized identities uh, at a personal and an institutional level? And the last question is, how do we approach inclusive community building within the scientific institutions? Um, and so kind of looking at these two things when we work with individuals, and I often think about, this is simplistic, of course, but thinking about accommodations to create that level playing field. Um, and by the way, when I get that question from faculty that, well, uh, they're getting all these accommodations, they'll never get a job in this field. So, and I said, oh, this is really interesting that you shared this. I didn't know that we promised students to graduate in this field that they would get jobs. It's like all of a sudden they changed the rules. Like if it's a student with a disability, well, what if they can't be successful? And I said, well, until you're willing to have that conversation about other uh, students in your class and guaranteeing their success, I don't think that's the right conversation to have. Our job is to provide accommodations so that there's a level playing field to learn the content of the course that you happen to be teaching. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, so let's talk about, you know, how, providing things for individuals, kind of systemic change, how we can make sure that happens. And then um, also systemically, um, how can we make sure that diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts include individuals with disabilities, including those with marginalized status, uh, multiple status, um, and, um, and even incorporating approaches like universal design or inclusive design or, or whatever. So who would like to start talking about that uh, group of concepts? <laughs> this is Gabby, I can start. Um, one of my big things that I've been thinking about a lot right now is how to have networking events that are accessible and welcoming um, and how to do that virtually or physically, hopefully soon that might happen physically. But right now, what I've seen a lot is that people tend to schedule things at bars. And I find that bars are like one of the least accessible, least welcoming places. Um, to go. It's not helpful if you have a hearing disability, if you get migraines, if you can't stand at the bar. There's so many different reasons. And like, that doesn't mean you shouldn't invite us to the bar, like maybe we'll go. But hosting an inclusive or networking event is very hard to make it inclusive and accessible at a bar. So one really quick fix is to not do that and to provide accessibility information for whatever type of event you're going to have. Be specific about it. Ideally, you would have a wide range of access. For example, here we have captions, we have ASL interpreters, and hopefully people are aware of that ahead of time. But my like really easy tip is just don't hold events at a bar. And to think about that systemically, because some people will respond with something like that. Well, well, if they don't want to meet at the bar, then we can we can do it in another place. In other acting, asking the person to decide it's not uh, very inclusive of them, uh, but they should be thinking more um, generally. And if they are going to meet in the bar, make that the optional activity at least. <laughs> the social, not business oriented. And think about the bathroom. Think about all the other aspects that go into being at a bar. Like if there's only two single gender restrooms, like who's going to be included there? Who's not? So a hot take again. And we have some, but there are also others online of guidelines for designing an accessible meeting, an accessible conference. Um, and so forth. And so there are things, Google it. You'll find the resources we have on our websites, um, but also others have posted. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll go next because um, you had mentioned, uh, uh, you know, universal accessibility and, and things like that. And I think that's definitely a good start, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Um, you can at least push for that. You know, I, I like to also remind people that you may not know what you want to do. You just want to use your power to do something. Um, so you don't have to change every university policy at, you, you know, that that you're at. Your, your, your thing can say, I just want captions. <laughs> you know, um, you can find that one thing and you can be the caption champion. You know, you can, hey, I've noticed that our, our flyers don't have alt text when you're sending these pictures. Um, this isn't, this isn't a accessible. Um, you can start there and, and learn where to get your voice and learn where to get your footing. Um, and then from there, 
learn more and grow more and do more. Um, I would also say take the time to listen to the groups and their needs um, and also make sure that they have space. Um, a lot of people get really offended when there's these personalized spaces for people, whether it be race or disability or sexuality um, and, and, you know, so many other ways that you can identify first gen, things like that. Again, I, I don't know why people feel so entitled to other people's uh, plights, <laughs> but I promise you it's, it's not a cakewalk. Um, it's not rainbows and unicorns. This isn't fun. <laughs> we just, we, we're trying to get to the fun. We're trying to enjoy the same things that we see other people enjoy. And in this case, it, it's typically the able-bodied um, cis het white man. Um, and so we just want to be able to enjoy our spaces and, but also talk to people that know our plight and, and understand, you know, me saying, dang, I've been fatigued for the last two weeks with a bunch of other people that are disabled would say, oh, dang, I know that, you know, do you have, you know, do you need anything? Here's a heating pad. I'm sending some water. Um, but somebody that may not be disabled is just like, I don't get it. Just take some naps, go get caffeine. Like you're going to be fine. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> you don't get it. Um, and so understanding that sometimes people still need, need that space to be able to, to feel welcome um, and not only have DEI initiatives, but have DEI policy um, and make sure that you are looking at all the different intersections and, and being culturally competent. And if somebody says, hey, this really isn't working, um, don't get offended. Just again, adjust, pivot, that's life. Um, we're all learning, um, we're, we're learning best practices and sometimes we're learning best practices as we go. Um, nomenclature changes. Um, the internet's fast, um, and so you have to be just as fast as that as it is, um, and and work towards steering the boat in the cor correct direction. So, um, figure out where you want to be that champion. It doesn't have to be big. Um, figure out other people that you can get involved in. Again, it doesn't have to be anything official, um, and and just do what you can. I I the last thing I'll say. Hopefully, I don't know. We'll see, but. I, I like to think of any type of this advocacy work, um, I, I sing in a choir, um, and I like to think about it as music um, in production. Um, there's singers, there's musicians, there's a conductor, there's stage tech, um, there's lighting, there's sounds. Not everybody's on the stage, not everybody enjoys being on stage, but even those that are on stage, if I have to sing a note, one note that's the entire, you know, sheet of music with no breath marks, they just tied that one note, I, I, there's physically no way I can hold one note for five minutes without passing out. Um, and so you lean on other people. Sometimes you have to drop out um, and let other people take up the work that you that you need so you can catch your breath and then come back in. Um, and so again, also just figuring out where you are and, and kind of the symphony or the concert of life um, and how you make the show better um, and, and help other people in the process. Um, because, yeah, I, I'm singing, maybe I'm the, the star of the show, but I'm singing for my audience. It's not just for me. Um, the tech people are making sure people can see and hear. Um, and, and, you know, we're all working together for a common goal. And just remember that um, and in finding people that can help you continue to do that. Thank you. And continuing to find roles for various stakeholder groups. Some people don't realize what power they have in a certain thing. They might be in charge of a budget or the uh, space or so forth, and that everyone can contribute. We're going to keep going on this conversation, but at this point, we want to make sure that we open the discussion to those of you who are listening via the webcast. Uh, we've been monitoring, moder uh, monitoring your questions, and we'll bring them into the conversation now, and we'll still continue to include the panel, by the way. So if you have more to say about, on any of this, uh, please speak up. Um, and please feel free to add your ideas to the live question and answer. So I, I will chime in and add, I'm going to say it's always exciting for me when I join a panel that makes me feel like I don't have to say anything at all because everyone says all the things. So I'm going to try not to repeat, but we'll <laughs> add, add my little bit to it is that, you know, we tell people that when you've met one person with a disability, you've met one person with a disability. So what I encourage people is to not take something that one of us says and then think that you can then just apply it to every single person with a disability you meet. 
because disability is a diverse group of individuals, a diverse population. And so that's when then people say, well, and this is difficult, doctor. Oh, like, how am I ever going to know how to help someone? I got all these things and I got captions and alt text and ramps. And how am I ever going to know how to then be accessible and inclusive? And this is the most simple answer. As I say, ask people. I tell people I am still learning. I do not know every single thing about this space. And I even sent, you know, Cheryl a, a private message earlier saying I want to learn more about her do it work because this is something that is constantly evolving. As Alexis said, the internet is fast. We have things today that we didn't have yesterday. And that means we have opportunities to make things more accessible. And so I acknowledge that I'm still learning. I don't know everything. And that's why I'm very comfortable sharing the things that I don't know to be able to do better. And I think that all of us need to be able to have the grace to recognize that we are all going to be able to learn with and from each other and that it's okay to not know. Because I think that where this comes from most of the time is that when you are in the position of power, when you are the leader, when you are the majority, it is not a safe space for you to feel as though you're making yourself vulnerable to acknowledge that you don't know something. And I think we all need to recognize that we don't know many things and we can then learn from each other but don't learn from that one person and think that's the only disability experience you need to hear from. That's why diversity is important because the diversity of thought and of experience and of perspective is going to allow you to see things, to learn things, to hear things that you would not have learned or seen or thought if you did not have a diverse group of people around you. And so that is, I think, a way that we can strive for that is if you listen to people and ask them questions about how they need or can be accommodated, that's one thing that you can do. Do not yeah. then make people that sort of monolith for you. And then I'll end with just a, a very short story about something that sort of opened my eyes to this. One of my faculty sort of uh, mentors had a son who was colorblind and he was in first grade kindergarten and his homework would say, color the circle blue. And I might've said this in the keynote, I don't remember, but. I did. I already told the story. But it's a good story. So tell I'll, it just in I'll, case I'll, they didn't I'll watch finish it. the story in case okay. someone didn't watch. So really quickly, this man asked his son, how do you get your homework done? Because it says color the circle blue. And his son said, dad, I never use crayons that aren't labeled. Sometimes the solution to what the inaccessibility is, is not something that is so far fetched and difficult to do. But we may not see the solution ourselves unless we then include the individuals and then have that experience. So that is really the, the way that we can get there is not saying that there is one group that knows and another group that doesn't. It's recognizing that at any given point, we may be the teacher and the student at the same time. And that's the way that we can all learn from each other. And that's what we do in our work. That's what we do in STEM. And so therefore it shouldn't be that hard to apply that same mentality to then being inclusive and accessible to then make sure that everyone is valued in our space. Great point. I'd like to add one thing to that. Is there some certain, some basic things you should not have to ask somebody uh, for? For example, if you're giving a PowerPoint presentation, do you make sure that you verbalize all the key content that's on the PowerPoint, that you don't just say this, this circle over here or whatever? Um, when I give a PowerPoint presentation, I just simply try to think that there's somebody, or I think that there's somebody calling in by phone because they can't get their video up. Could be someone who's blind, I don't know. But I just assume when I go into my presentation that there are some people that can't see the screen. screen. And so you make sure you provide that in multiple ways. And that kind of leads us to universal design and other uh, proactive approaches where there's some things we just do, just like we have the elevators and buildings and ramps and so forth. So that's one area you can work on too, kind of that basic, what's a good thing to do to make sure that everybody's included. So Kate, did you have a comment? Well, I was thinking of my disability studies classes, uh, which is a perfect place, one of the perfect places uh, to uh, get to know other people with disabilities. Anyway, uh, we had one on sex. Uh, you know, other than money, we don't talk about sex. So, uh, uh, and it was led by two people with disability, a man and a woman, and uh, then working with somebody who didn't have a disability. And uh, it was really highly successful in part, I must say, maybe Dr. Kugler will tell me I'm prejudiced, that we have a lot of engineering, male engineering students in our class, and they're pretty basic. 
So uh, uh, I learned that the penis is a very unusual and diverse uh, organ. Uh, so that came out there. Then another another guy said um, that uh, when he went in a bar before he had his accident, he felt like he could just be a big flirt. And then when he rolled in as a person with quadriplegia, uh, he felt like he was not attractive anymore. And then a young woman, and I can certainly feel this, said, my boyfriend whispered into my hearing aids and started ringing. But there are lots of little things you can get to know. Uh, disability studies is certainly one of the, of the platforms for doing that. Uh, another, another area that we introduced in that class was addiction. Uh, and the experience of, uh, we actually, I actually brought, we actually brought in addicted, very bright CPAs and so on and so forth. So there, I think there are many venues that are social based uh, that uh, uh, don't, you know, we don't have to get into regulation and law uh, as well, of course, as we have to fight for infrastructures and budgets. I'll um, kind of jump in, I think, based on more social things, I think I want to touch on community building because I think that meeting people that are disabled has been, I mean, events where I meet people that are disabled, getting coffee with a coworker that's disabled with someone I would meet for some kind of, you know, other shared uh, thing like Kate was talking about, um, or uh, you know, those are the things that that really sustain me um, to do, not just like you know in my life, but to do work, to to feel energized um, at my job, working with another disabled coworker, and so I think that um, you know, meeting people, having opportunities to. To, to meet people and to openly have space to to talk about being disabled, to feel welcome in spaces where I'm the only disabled person um, to talk about my disability. Uh, those are the kinds of community building activities that really um, are what keep that diversity and transform it into equity. And so really focusing on creating spaces um, for people if you are not disabled or, you know, seeking out those spaces as a disabled person, uh, I think is really key. Yeah, I, I don't know if there are any questions, but I did want to briefly mention that we automatically assume that ableism is, is the default, but you really are just one accident away from becoming disabled. If you really think about it, you are, you are a few years away, you know, as you start aging from being disabled um, and having those conversations and, and diversifying who you see can also help. Um, and then especially with healthcare being the way it is in America, there are still kind of the two definitions of disability, whether it be you medically defined disability or your self-defined and self-diagnosed disability. Um, and so for people that may not have access to healthcare either, that's that's also something to consider when it comes to accessibility and things like that. Um, a lot of times you have to have some type of doctor's note or some type of test to verify that you're as disabled as you say you are. Um, and that can also be a, a really huge hurdle for people that may not have access to healthcare to be able to do those things. So by just making, or, you know, people may not be comfortable, you know, mental health is still severely stigmatized. And so you don't want to exclude somebody that doesn't feel safe enough to, dis you know, disclose this type of information. So just building all of that in, it, it keeps people safe, it shows that you care and, and that you're willing to work with these individuals and that it's welcoming. But again, if you don't do any of that, you're not saying you're doing much um, and, and you need to 
reevaluate your life. <laughs> and that's just the nice way I'm going to put it. But, um, you know, just again, thinking about all the barriers that somebody th can come up against. And I mean, as, as most Americans, I mean, we're all in the healthcare boat, really. Um, and it's a really huge discussion. So if nothing else, even just think about that and, and the access to healthcare that people have. Any other comments, questions? Yeah, it's, it's Kate. Can I say something here? Yes. Uh, there's a movement out there I haven't heard it spoken of here very much called the disability movement. It was born a long, long time ago and uh, it's carried a lot of the water here. And uh, say so when I was uh, to skip, I was an early part of that movement too. So and other people I'm sure here who I don't speak any of the wet white hair, but uh, uh, in, in any case, in, in Pittsburgh, there was a council on disability uh, at the municipal level. There were many Easter seal, there were many, many, many. Uh, uh, so uh, one time a young woman, PhD, uh, would be a PhD candidate came in. She was not in rehabilitation and science, but she was, and she was a marvelous young woman and she had autism. And uh, we started, I connected, we connected her into various networks in the community. Uh, she's now sitting on the state legislature and I think she's still in her twenties. Uh, she, she, but th this can happen, uh, but we do have to do outreach a little bit uh, out of maybe, you know, some, uh, might not be so easy sometimes, but Pittsburgh, of course, was extraordinarily well developed in terms of the disability community and, of course, the scientific community. We need to find each other. There's some questions that have come in on the Q&A chat. Um, one that I think is worth uh, talking about here with our last few minutes is, how do we address hidden disabilities and mental health challenges? Um, I think that uh, uh, I, I've been looking at this whole uh, session as talking about including those as well at various types of disabilities, but um, some people uh, don't always see that as the same, but I think we can still look at that. Uh, the things that we've said here, it's come up to talk to people with, you know, with disabilities, talk to them about what they might need in a specific situation working with a person with a disability. Um, I read a research article a long time ago now where actually people without disabilities ask for more accommodations than students with, with disabilities. I don't know if that's true, but that was an interesting thought. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, but um, but also that's where universal design can come in as well, and also inclusive practices that are proactive. Um, if you work, for instance, if you're working with someone on the autism spectrum, um, or someone with executive function issues, uh, both invisible disabilities, unless they have an intersection with another type of disability, uh, one of the uh, if you do much reading on this or whatever, one key at thing that you can do is just make instructions very clear, uh, instructions in a science lab, for instance, step by step. And sometimes instructors back in the old days when we were on site, where they put something on the PowerPoint, you know, on, and then they go into the lab from there and make sure there's a handout that it has very clear instructions. It's one of the best things we can do for individuals with individual uh, in. Uh, invisible disabilities, um, especially when they apply to executive functioning and and um, and so forth. So, any other comments about uh, specifically about addressing hidden disabilities, including mental health impairments? My very short my very short experience with that. But first of all, I just think that was a great response. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very concrete and it was very. But when I we were developing uh, relationships with students with disabilities within uh, the people with mental uh, related disabilities. One of their complaints was their relationship with their faculty. I heard more of that with, uh, so it's probably true that uh, we have to learn more of what Cheryl is recommending here in infrastructure uh, so that you know, we can follow through. I, I think it's, it's, it's a very difficult area uh, and not as easy 
I mean, I have had a hidden disability all my life, and, um, uh, but it's a lot different than having a, a mental uh, or uh, a cognitive disability. So I'll, I'll chime in. This is fairly speaking. And if you can't tell yet, I, I like sort of giving responses in story form. Uh, I, I gave a TED talk a couple of years ago, and it was framed around Mr. Rogers. So I might be dating myself a little bit, but we, you know, Mr. Rogers had a song at the beginning of the show was talking about, you know, won't you be my neighbor? And so I, I framed this conversation around the fact that people tend to address things that they're proximal to. And so I gave a, a sort of a, an analogy about if someone's house is on fire, you know, if that house is your house, you clearly care that the house is on fire. If the house is your neighbor's house, you might care if their house is on fire because you one may know your neighbor and you care about your neighbor, or it may be that you worry that their house will then cause your house to catch on fire. And so if you feel as though there's something in your neighborhood that may impact you, that is why then people tend to then do something about it. Now, I give this little story because I think that the problem at times is we create an us versus them dynamic in this conversation around disability. And, you know, Alexis touched on this earlier in a way that at times, like when I'm in more sort of engaging back and forth conversation, this can come across as contentious. But when she said, you're one accident away, you're a couple birthdays away from having some mobility difficulties or hearing difficulties or seeing difficulties and why we create this dynamic that disabled people are other and it's them that we're doing these things for. That's the reason why we don't have things that are accessible. So I'm, I'm using this one to talk about how we also address the hidden disabilities and mental health challenges. If we recognize that that is really humanity, right? Every single one of us exists on some, and I'll use the word spectrum, right? Some spectrum here of disabled or able. There's no line in the sand that says, this is what then makes you disabled. Because even as a healthcare provider, right, we talk about this medical model of disability, but we're looking for a line somewhere and there is no line. And so I think that if we recognize this as what can we do to make sure as many people have access as they can, right? That is what we then do. So hidden invis disabilities, invisible disabilities, mental health, when we recognize that, hey, you know what? This pandemic has showed us that if you are sick, don't come to work because people don't want to get sick now, right? But we need to normalize the fact that people may need breaks. People may need time to then spend by themselves. And so these are some small things that have created a dynamic now that we have a lot more flexibility in our work environments. We have a lot more a sort of understanding that there may be things that happen in life. You need to stay at home and quarantine with your child because third grade had an outbreak of COVID and you have to be at home. So these are some of the things that, have, that the disabled community has been asking for for a long time. Remote work, virtual work, time and flexibility. So these are things that when we realize this is going to benefit all of us, you don't have to think of it purely through the lens of I'm helping my disabled peer here. You see it as I'm helping humans. I'm helping make this environment an environment where everyone can be more welcoming because that then doesn't make people worry about doing the disability dance of how can I make sure I'm not stepping on the wrong toes and so I think that if we view it that way, that changes the stigma around disability specifically, even though I have nothing wrong with saying the word and calling out disability and making sure that that is recognized, there's still some people that were, their, their little sphere of influence that they can impact change is truly just in that vein without feeling like they have to understand disability. You just understand people and the fact that people all have different needs and therefore let's figure out what we can do to then support people. Excellent way to uh, draw our conversation to a close here. And it's even an interesting exercise in workshops and presentations, I think, to look at ability rather than disability. Because everyone in this room, there's some people have disabilities and some don't in this particular conversation today, but we all have abilities. And so every one of us could rate our ability to see and our ability to hear, our ability to manage our physical health or our mental health. Uh, and we could do that individually. My guess is there would be no two ratings exactly the same. And so diversity, uh, intersectionality, all these things are the way uh, things are in the world. And so uh, being proactive about making things more inclusive and then being responsive to individuals um, who have uh, specific uh, needs and being successful. Uh, so we've had a great time. Uh, 
Everyone, uh, thanks for the fantastic conversation that we've had today and how intersectionality is critical to STEM, uh, particularly in fostering a, cu a culture um, and actionable plans to improve accessibility and inclusion in STEM. We talked about some practical um, ways to address this issue, but there's a lot more that we all need to think about on our own campuses and institutions. Uh, we heard at the beginning of the conversation, this is just the first of many discussions. Our next conversation in this series will be on Tuesday, January 25th, mark it down, Tuesday, January 25th, from 10.30 to noon um, Eastern Standard Time, uh, we'll focus on specific recommendations to improve accessibility and inclusion in the context of lab work. That came up a little bit today, but we're gonna focus on that the whole time next time. We hope you can join us. Additional information about that conversation will be available on our series uh, website, and so uh, this webcast will be recorded and posted on the website, uh, as will all future conversations. So enjoy the rest of the day, um, and we hope to see you in January. So um, thanks for joining us, and thanks, panelists, for being part of this. This has been great fun. It went so fast. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.